We're going to start with this warm-up. Using the definition of the derivative defined f prime of x if f of x is x to the power of n. So go ahead and set up your limit. I'm going to give you a hint. You're going to need to use some binomial expansion to help you simplify. Okay, so using the definition of derivative, we're going to take the limit as h approaches 0 of x plus h quantity to the power of n minus x to the n over h. So in purple, you're going to see binomial expansion. And obviously, I can't show every single term. So I'm showing n choose 0 of x to the power of n plus n choose 1 times x to the power of n minus 1 times h. So our x exponents, our exponents with x are decreasing as our exponents with h are increasing. And then now we can simplify this. n choose 0 is 1, so I'm going to have x to the n, and I also have negative x to the n. Those are going to add to be 0. The next thing I'm going to notice is that every single term that remains has an h, and that h I could factor to the front and then divide out with the h in the denominator. So I'm going to rewrite my new limit simplified. So I no longer have a denominator. Now, looking at each of these terms, I'm looking for the limit as h approaches 0. Well, every single term besides the first term is going to have an h in it. Therefore, as h approaches 0, all of those terms are approaching 0. So what I'm left with is that this limit as h approaches 0 is equal to n choose 1 times x to the power of n minus 1. And anything choose 1 is itself. So that's going to tell me that f prime of x is equal to n times x to the power of n minus 1. So if you took a, b last year, this is what we know as the power rule. It's going to make our lives a lot easier when taking derivatives of polynomials. So if you are more visual, I have attached in the slideshow for today a link to a Khan Academy video that gives you a more visual understanding of why the power rule works. To me, the algebraic proof is more important, but I think some of you might benefit from seeing sort of visually why the power rule works. So go ahead and check that out if you need the extra support or the extra visual. So here is our power rule. And it basically says that if we're taking the derivative of a polynomial or a polynomial term, what we can do is decrease the exponent by one and move the original exponent to the front. So if you look at number one, f of x is x to the fourth. So I'm gonna decrease the exponent by one, that makes it three, and I'm gonna move this four that was originally the exponent to the front. So there's not really a lot of work that you need to show when you're doing that, you're just using the power rule. Now the constant rule, if you think about a constant, if I'm graphing a function like f of x equals three, the derivative is the slope of the tangent line, and the slope of a constant, of a line that is constant, has a slope of zero. So it should make sense that the derivative of a constant is zero. The scalar rule just says if I have a number, a scalar, a c value that's being multiplied by my function, I can just multiply the derivative by that value. And the sum rule says if I have multiple terms, I can look at each term separately, which is really helpful when we're looking at a polynomial that has three or four terms. We can use the power rule on each individual term. So let's go ahead and look at number two. Notation-wise on number two, I'm not going to write f prime of x because I don't have a function of x. I have a function of y. So here is where you're going to see dy dx, meaning the derivative of y with respect to x. And here we're going to use the sum rule and the power rule. For x to the negative 2 thirds power, I'm going to use the power rule. So I'm going to drop the negative 2 thirds to the front times x, and then I'm going to subtract 1. Negative 2 thirds minus 1 is going to be negative 5 thirds. You are more than welcome to leave the negative exponent like that. I know in lower levels we make you rewrite it with positive exponents. Here, just leave it as a negative exponent. And then the other piece is a constant, so the derivative of a constant is just zero, so really that's plus zero, which you obviously don't need to write, but I want you to see where that derivative is going. So go ahead and pause the video and work on three and four. So something that might help you get started on number three is to rewrite the second term using negative exponents. That makes it easier to use the power rule. 
the derivative of 5, which is just a constant, is going to go to 0, minus 1 half times, if I move that exponent forward, negative 3, so 1 half times negative 3, times t to the negative 3 minus 1, which is going to be negative 4. So let's clean this up a little bit. That's going to give me positive 3 over 2, t to the negative 4th, or 3 over 2t to the 4th. Again, on number four, it might be easier to rewrite using negative exponents so that you can apply the power rule to each individual term. So f prime of x is going to equal five times negative two, because you're moving that exponent forward, x to the negative third, negative two minus one, plus three times two x. And if I simplify that, I'm gonna get negative 10 x to the negative third plus six x. You do not need to show this middle step, especially if you took AB last year, but I don't want to lose any of you. You could also write that as negative 10 over x to the third plus 6x, f prime of x equals. So those four rules are now differentiation rules that you can use unless a problem specifically asks you to use the definition of derivative. Much, much faster than doing all that limit work that we did in 1.4. So differentiability, a function is differentiable at C if the limit as X approaches C of F of X minus F of C over X minus C equals L. This should look really familiar. This is the alternative definition of a derivative, meaning we're looking at a particular value, not for the function along the entire curve that represents the derivative. So it's differentiable at a particular C value if the limit as X approaches C at that value, if it exists. So what that means is that f of c must exist. There actually has, the function has to exist at that value, and the limit from the left and the limit from the right must be the same. So this looks really similar to what we talked about when we talked about continuity. In order for a function to be differentiable at a value, that function must be continuous at that value, and the left and right derivatives must be the same. So let's talk about a couple of reasons that a function might not be differentiable at a particular value. One is that it's not continuous at that point. There could be a hole or an asymptote or a jump discontinuity. That would mean that the left and right derivative are not the same or they don't exist for some reason. Therefore, it would not be differentiable at that value. Another reason that a function may not be differentiable at a particular value is if there is a sharp turn, such as in an absolute value curve, a sharp turn does not have the same slope on the left and the right, meaning this portion of our justification is not true. So that could be a reason. And lastly, that there is a vertical tangent line at that point. So I wanna look at whether or not a function is differentiable at a particular value, both graphically and in the form of a function. So let's start with these four, five graphic examples. So it says each example below is not differentiable at x equals one using the above definition state y. So for this first one, sorry, they're not numbered. The reason is that there is a hole at x equals one. That's why it's not differentiable, which means that f of c does not exist. For the second one, there is a jump discontinuity, so it's not continuous. For the third one, there is a vertical asymptote. So again, the left and right limits are not the same. And the value doesn't exist at f of one. So that actually doesn't meet two requirements. f of c doesn't exist and the left and right limits aren't the same. This fourth one, would not be continuous at x equals one because there is a sharp turn. So that's the second reason here. And the last one is that there is a, is the third reason over here. There is a vertical tangent line at that point. Okay, the last thing on this slide, important to note, if a function is differentiable, then it must be continuous. The reverse of that is not true, or the converse if you think back to geometry. So what is true is that if we know a function is differentiable, then we can state that it is continuous. If it is continuous, that doesn't mean that it's differentiable. And the, an example for that is right here. This looks like an absolute value function that's translated one to the right. That function is continuous everywhere along 
the function, but it's not differentiable everywhere along the function. So you can say because it is because we know a function is differentiable, we know it is continuous, but you can't say the converse of that. Something else that you can say is that a function must be continuous to be differentiable. So if it is not continuous, it is not differentiable. If it is not continuous, it is not differentiable. So I would make sure to write those two things down. Okay, we're going to look at four more examples, and I want to talk through them graphically, but I also want to show the work algebraically. So we're going to look at all four of them, thinking about what's happening in the graph first, and then I'm going to erase all that and go back and look at the actual equation and show how you can mathematically prove it as well. So for number five, that's the absolute value graph. This is not differentiable at x equals zero, because at x equals zero, we have a sharp turn. Similarly, on number six, I have a quadratic on the left. I have a linear portion of a function on the right. This is not differentiable at x equals zero. So both of these are not because of sharp turns. For seven, it's not continuous at x equals zero. So it's not differentiable. So you could say there's a jump discontinuity, or you could just say not continuous. And eight, there is a vertical asymptote at x equals 1, so it's not continuous, meaning it's not differentiable at x equals 1. Also note on number 8 that it's also not differentiable at x equals 0 because the function doesn't exist at x equals 0. There would be a hole. Oh, that doesn't look very good. There would be a hole, an open circle in the function, since those x's are dividing out, that would lead to a hole in the graph. But now let's look at all that algebraically. Okay, so if I actually break up absolute value into a step function, then it's easier to see where we might have an issue. So the only place we might have an issue is at zero. Everywhere else it's clearly continuous and it is continuous at x equals zero, but x equals zero is the only place where we may have an issue with differentiability. Because left of zero, I have a line, the line y equals negative x, and right of zero, I have the line y equals x. I'm not gonna have any issues with differentiation of a line. So the three requirements, if you think back to this slide, f of c must exist, and the derivative from the left, that's what this is, at that value, and the derivative from the right at that value must be the same. So let's go ahead and take the derivative. So I can actually say that f prime of x is equal to the set. Well, the derivative of negative x is negative one, just using the power rule, and that is still when x is less than or equal to zero. The derivative of positive x is positive one when x is greater than zero. So this is not, differentiable at x equals zero, which we had already determined, but now you're seeing the algebra behind why that works. So let's follow the same process for number six. Let's find the derivative of each individual piece, and then the only value that is questionable is what happens when x equals zero. So f prime of x is gonna be two x when x is less than or equal to zero, and one when x is greater than zero, again, 2x is coming from the power rule derivative of x to the second. 1 is coming from the derivative of x, which is just 1. Now, if when I plug 0 in for these, they're the same, then this is differentiable. In this case, they're not. If I plug 0 into the top portion, I'm going to get 0. The bottom portion doesn't have an x. 0 is not equal to 1. So I'm going to just say this is also true here. The deriv It's not differentiable at x equals zero. It is differentiable everywhere else, but it's not differentiable at the value where x equals zero. Go ahead and pause this video and try and do number seven. Number seven's a little tricky because if you think about what's happening, you know the value that's in question here is what's happening at x equals zero. If you went through the process of taking the left and the right derivatives, think about what's happening with the derivatives here. They're both gonna be two x. F of zero does exist. So much of what is required over here is true. The, it must exist, and the left and the right derivatives need to be the same. In this case, both of those things would be true. But you really have to think about what is happening at zero. And as we showed graphically, what's happening is that there's a jump in the graph. We have sort of half of a parabola and then a jump 
and another half of the parabola. So even before thinking through any of this derivative work, you know that this is not differentiable at x equals zero because it's not continuous. So everything really, there's not a one step process to doing these. You just have to be thinking about what's happening at the function and considering what's happening at the value of interest. So similarly, thinking about number eight, the first thing my brain just automatically goes to simplifying. The first thing I notice is that I can simplify this, which means right away we have a whole at x equals zero, which means right away it's not continuous there, therefore it's not differentiable there. If it's not continuous, it's not differentiable. The other thing I notice is that would leave me with one over x minus one, which without graphing, just thinking back to algebra two, I know that this means that there is a vertical asymptote at x equals one, which again means that it is not continuous. So you really have to consider what's happening with the function when you think through the approach that you're taking. Next, we're gonna talk about higher order derivatives. Since the derivative is a function, that means that we could repeat that process again. We could continue to take the derivative of a derivative, and those are called higher order derivatives. So notation-wise, the first derivative, we already talked about all of these notations at the very beginning. As soon as you go up in derivative, you, in this form, add another quotation mark or another little tick mark. So this becomes y double prime or y triple prime or y to the however many primes. Sometimes you might see if it's getting really big, like the sixth derivative with a six written up there, or f prime of x, f double prime of x, f triple prime of x. Again, the different forms, dy dx. Here you're gonna notice that this is the second derivative with respect to x, the third derivative with respect to x. So notice where those threes and twos are in the higher order derivatives um, in this particular notation. It's really important to have that syntax right. Similarly for this last column. So take a look over those notations. You're gonna see them enough. You're gonna get comfortable with the way they look, but just make sure you're being precise there. And then we're just gonna look at this example over here and we're gonna find a handful of derivatives. So for the first derivative, I'm gonna move the exponent down. Negative two thirds times th positive three is gonna give me negative two. And if I subtract one from the exponent, I'm gonna get negative five thirds. If I took the derivative of that derivative or the second derivative, negative five thirds times two, negative two is positive 10 thirds x. And if I subtract one, I'm gonna get negative eight thirds. So that process could continue going. This could keep going for a third derivative. I would drop negative eight thirds, multiply that by 10 thirds and subtract one from the exponent. Something that is important to notice, if I have something like x to the fourth, that derivative will eventually go to zero. So the first derivative here would be four x to the third. The second derivative would be 12 x squared. The third derivative would be 24 x. Oh, I'm out of space. The fourth derivative would be 24 and the fifth derivative would be zero. So depending on the type of function, it's possible that you're gonna to get to a point where every derivative after that value is zero. That won't happen with this function because our, our exponent is just gonna continue getting more and more negative. Okay, last topic before just some practice problems. I know this video is getting long and that is never my goal, but 1.5 is a little longer of a section. So the rates of change of a tangent line. So there's two ways that you're gonna commonly hear spoken of about rates of change. One of them being the average rate of change. The average rate of change, you're often gonna see it abbreviated as AROC, A-R-O-C, average rate of change, is the slope. Same slope formula that you learned in Algebra 1. No different at all. So if we're talking about the average rate of change, we are talking about the slope between two points. The instantaneous rate of change is actually talking about the derivative at an indicated value. So average rate of change, the slope between the two points, instantaneous rate of change, the derivative at a chosen x value. And that's called the IROC for instantaneous rate of change. And then you could find the tangent line by using the instantaneous rate of change as your slope and an indicated point to write the equation of a line. Um, just as a reminder, 
point slope form is typically the first form that you'll see the equation of a line written. And I know everybody gets really comfortable with slope intercept form, but if all you need is a slope and a point, it's going to be much less work to write the equation of a line in point slope form. It's actually not really helpful for you in calculus to have it written in slope intercept form. So we're going to move on to some example problems. I would recommend that you pause this video. I'm going to put the answers up and then talk through anything I think is a little bit more complicated and then we'll be done. So here's the worked out solutions for each of those. In purple is work that I would expect to see on each problem. In green, I showed some sort of, like on 10, I showed switching forms. On almost all of them, part B, I showed substituting in the value of x. In green, or some simplification portions for the math, you do not have to show all of those steps that are in green. I just show them, especially if this is your first time working with this. So go ahead and pause the video, check your answers, and then move on to 13 through 16. So a couple things to note. The ordered pair that you're using as your x1 and y1 on 13 is given to you in the problem. So you're going to find the derivative, f prime of x, then you're going to substitute in 2. That's going to give you 7, which is your slope, and then your tangent line can be written as y minus 5 equals 7 parentheses x minus 2. You're more than welcome to rewrite it in slope-intercept form. I'm just going to let you know the number of people that lost points for basic algebra, meaning they tried to write this in slope-intercept form, was really high last year. And just it's not a good use of your time to change this into slope-intercept form or to set it up and try and solve for B. It's just sort of a waste of time. Use the tools that you have and show the calculus understanding. For 14, something that's really different is that you're not given an ordered pair, but you are given an x value. So in order to find the ordered pair that you need for your tangent line, you actually have to plug in 2 into the function. So you'll see that in green on top. So that's where y minus 15 and x minus 2 is coming from. 15 is the value that you get when you plug 2 into the original function. So that's the point on the tangent line is 2, 15. I'm sorry, the point on the function is 2, 15. So you're going to find your derivative, you're going to substitute in 2 to find your slope, your slope is 36, and then you're going to write it in point-slope form. 15 is asking you for a horizontal tangent, that means that your slope is 0, so you're going to find the derivative, then you're going to set your derivative equal to 0 to find the x values that make that true. Similarly, on 16, it's asking you for when that ha the x values that make that have a slope of 18, so you're looking for your slope to be 18, you're going to find your derivative, set it equal to 18, and solve. So hopefully that makes you feel pretty good about 1.5. So to recap, we talked about the shortcuts or the basic differentiation rules, the power rule, the constant rule, the scalar rule, and the sum rule, and how to use those. We talked about what differentiability is and when it does not exist at sharp turns, holes, jumps, vertical asymptotes, vertical tangent lines. We talked about how differentiability means that something is continuous, but the converse of that is not true. We also talked about that if a function is not continuous, it's not differentiable at that value. We practiced finding derivatives or values where a derivative does not exist or a function is not differentiable. We talked about higher order derivatives. And then lastly, we talked about the average rate of change and the instantaneous rate of change. So go back through and look over any of those topics you need and let me know. If